Nike makes their shoes for $2 and sells them for $200. For as long as we can remember, we've been reading comments like these on the internet. But how much does it actually cost to make a sneaker? A $100 running shoe costs around $22 to produce, $5 to ship to the warehouse, then you add $5 for marketing, $11 for other expenses, and of course, $50 retailer margin. Because Nike and Adidas sell most of their shoes to retailers like Foot Locker and not directly to the consumer. That leaves the brands with around $5 profit on a $100 shoe. But wait, some sneakers cost way more than $100. Like those turquoise Nikes worn by Erling Haaland. They now sell for 18,000 euros, because they are a collaboration with jewelry brand Tiffany. It's one of the latest examples in a long row of sneaker collabs. Everyone is collaborating with everyone, blurring the lines between high fashion, sports and streetwear. It's about style, influence and a lot of money. And one man stands for this development like no other. Virgil Abloh. His influence has been compared to the likes of LeBron James and even Obama. He is the reason why people are willing to spend thousands on, well, running shoes. So what's his secret? As it turns out, he followed one simple rule. Welcome to Athletic Interest and the insane business of Virgil Abloh. This video is presented by Shopify. Let's start with some basics. The word collaboration carries a lot of meaning, especially online and in the world of fashion. In its essence, it means two brands working together to create a product. Why? To create new perspectives. Collabs allow brands to experiment with new colors, materials and silhouettes. Collabs attract media attention. The hype can lead to a level of exposure that is hard to match with traditional advertising. And most importantly, Collabs expand your audience. Like when Jordan and PSG joined forces, introducing PSG to a basketball-savvy American audience and Jordan to a football-savvy European audience. But this is not a completely new phenomenon. The world of sneaker collaborations is a captivating journey through innovation, culture and creativity. Our story begins with the early days of athletic footwear. One of the most famous shoes ever is actually the result of a collaboration. Chucks are called Chucks because Converse made them after partnering with basketball player Chuck Taylor. These kinds of collaborations between athletes and brands were primarily driven by functionality with a focus on improving performance. The 1980s and 90s marked a significant shift in the sneaker landscape. Hip-hop culture and streetwear brought sneakers from the playing fields to the streets. Brands like Nike and Adidas recognized the potential of aligning themselves with urban culture. Run DMC turned the Adidas superstar into an icon, and the Air Jordan line became a symbol of both athletic excellence and street credibility. Skateboarding played a pivotal role in pushing sneakers beyond traditional athletic spheres. Brands like Vans embraced skate culture by collaborating with pro skateboarders and artists. These partnerships blurred the line between sport and art, creating sneakers that were not just for performance, but also self-expression. A prime example for this is the Nike Pigeon Dunk, the shoe that has forever changed the sneaker game. The design, created by Jeff Staple, wanted to combine the world of skateboarding and the soul of New York City in a single item. He decided that pigeons would best represent the Big Apple vibe. The colorway was inspired by the colors of the bird. Three different grays, black and white areas, orange sole like the Lex and upper in new book leather to recreate the softness of the feathers. Just 150 pairs were made and the hype was real. The NYPD arrested about 20 people, including some lower east side thugs lurking on street corners ready to rob the lucky ones who managed to get the pigeons. Knives, baseball bats and even a machete were found outside the store. The next day, the New York Post covered the story on the front page, and from that day, interest in sneakers increased, and with it, the secondary market. That was in 2005. The hype begins. But we are still far away from where we are today, when fashion brands like Gucci sign footballers. Unthinkable at the beginning of the century. So what happened? The answer is Virgil Abloh. But before we learn about him, we need to talk about this. 
We now have socks. Made in Italy from organic cotton, the first drop is limited to 100 pairs. But no need to start a ride, you can just go to athleticinterest.com slash shop and order them online. Thanks to today's video sponsor Shopify. If you've been following our channel, you know we've been doing a whole series on elite athletes running their businesses on Shopify. So we figured it was time to give it a try. The idea? High quality classic tennis socks. Made by friends of ours who run a small family business in northern Italy. So we had the idea, the design, the manufacturer and the product. The only thing missing was an online store. And everything you need to run it. From tracking inventory to processing payments and printing shipping labels. Shopify makes it all super easy. Even for those with no technical skills. It's the all-in-one commerce platform that lets you start, grow and manage a business. So if you're a creator or an athlete who wants to learn how to monetize through merchandise, be sure to check shopify.com slash athletic interest. But now back to the story. To understand the state of sportswear today, we need to understand the life of Virgil Abloh. Born near Chicago in 1980, his parents had immigrated a few years earlier from Ghana. His mother worked as a dressmaker and his father managed a paint company. As a teenager, Abloh gets into hip-hop. He skates, starts DJing and is a huge street art fan. He also starts tagging a bit himself. His interest in fashion at that point is limited to a few skate brands, especially Nike because he is a huge Michael Jordan fan. He even comes up with his own designs and sends them to Nike. But they don't accept sent-in designs. They couldn't know who was writing them back then. His parents want him to get a proper job, so Ablo studies architecture. One of his biggest inspirations back then happens to be in a think tank for new Prada designs. And so the door to fashion opens for Ablo. He asks his mom to teach him how to sew and starts designing some shirts. When he goes to a store to print the shirts, the people at the store are so impressed by the quality of his files that they offer him a job. This is where he met a music manager who eventually introduced him to an important business partner, Kanye West. It's a turning point in Ablo's career. The two click and Ablo becomes Yee's creative assistant, helping with the designs of album covers. The two then do something very unexpected. They become interns at Fendi in Rome. Yeah, they were actually interns, getting coffee and photocopying documents. It shows how much they both wanted to enter the world of fashion. Ablo's first completely own label is Pyrex Vision. He buys old stock of Ralph Lauren shirts for $40, prints the world Pyrex and a 23, the number of Michael Jordan on the back, and sells them for $550. Pyrex is actually a company that makes measuring cups, which are very heat resistant and therefore often used to cook crack. So Ablo's message is something like this. As a black man from Chicago, there are two pathways out of poverty, drug dealing and sports. At some point, the original Pyrex brand wasn't happy with how Ablo used its trademark, so he had to stop. But it paved the way for his new label, Off-White. And now his career takes off completely. Thanks to his network, celebrities like Kim Kardashian, Serena Williams or Beyoncé started wearing Off-White. The hype is real. By the end of 2018, Off-White was the hottest label in the world, even before Gucci. Part of the success? Collaborations. Furniture for IKEA, water bottles for Evian or Big Mac containers for McDonald's. Everyone wanted to collaborate with Off-White. But one partnership stuck more than all the others. In 2017, Off-White worked with Nike on a project called The Ten. So after all, Nike did accept his designs. Ablo broke down and rebuilt 10 iconic Nike silhouettes. The collab sold out immediately and the shoes remain one of the most sought after items to this day. It was the first time that Nike had really given true creative freedom to a collaborator. Ablo is crowned the most influential person of the year and the Air Jordan 1 Chicago the best sneaker of the year. Shortly after, Ablo is appointed artistic director of Louis Vuitton as the first POC in history. One of his friends even compared the moment to Obama becoming president. Ablo is at his peak. So how did he do it? How did a boy from Chicago make it to the top of the global fashion industry? Luckily, Ablo was very transparent about his thought process. He even gave a Harvard lecture about it and shared his work in progress with almost 7 million followers on Instagram. At the core of his creative philosophy is the 3% rule. 
Hablo explained at his Harvard lecture that the Nike products were so perfectly put together that he only wanted to make slight edits to give it a personal touch. Simply put, the idea of the 3% rule is to only change a product or idea by 3% to create something totally new. Why does this work? Because humans desire two competing things. Familiarity, to give us comfort, and novelty, to fulfill our curiosity. The challenge is to find the perfect balance. It may sound a bit too simple, but the psychology behind it is sound. The more often we see things, the more we prefer them. It is called the mere exposure effect. It makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Humans are cautious around new sights and sounds because they might be dangerous. But with repeated exposure over time, we become comfortable if it turns out there is no threat. And at some point, it becomes boring. So a small change can provide the novelty we crave without scaring us away. Just think about movies. We go and watch the same freaking story over and over again as long as there is a slight change to it. Or your Spotify playlists. Custom Discover playlists were initially meant to introduce completely new songs to users. But Spotify found out that the lists work much better when they include songs that the users had previously listened to. The inspiration for the 3% rule can be traced back to the artist Marcel Duchamp. He invented the so-called ready-mades. Random objects that he found somewhere, changed a little bit and then presented as art. For example, by painting a goatee on the Mona Lisa. The idea was to question the very notion of art. His fountain artwork, which was basically just a signed urinal, shocked the art world in 1917. Almost 100 years later, it was declared the most influential artwork of the 20th century. This element of parody and humor can also be found in Ablo's work, like the IKEA rug that says to keep off. But the 3% approach is not without critics, because it raises the question of what is original and what is just a plain copy. Some of Ablo's designs were called out for being mere copies of already existing designs. Even the off-white logo itself. In our digital age, the question of how much of an existing work needs to be changed in order to be original is more relevant than ever, especially on YouTube, where copyright strikes can end whole careers, and powerful companies like to abuse their power to keep small creators small. But that is stuff for another video. It just shows how relevant Virgil Abloh's work still is, even after he passed away in 2021. He left quite a legacy blurring the line between streetwear and high fashion. Sneaker collaborations have become a global phenomenon. It's not just about the shoes anymore. It's about storytelling, exclusivity, and the thrill of owning a piece of cultural history. The fact that Jack Grealish is now signed by Gucci is because Virgil Abloh and Off-White paved the way. And while Duchamp's fountain was crowned the most influential artwork of the 20th century, one could argue that Abloh's The Ten is the most influential sneaker collaboration of this century, at least so far. But there is also a new development. At some point, it felt that all the collabs were just too much, too superficial, too plastic. It felt like style was no longer driven by people's own personal taste, but rather by what other people thought was the most hyped and expensive item at the time. And now, the time of the hype culture seems to be over. Gen Z prefers a cleaner, less branded look. And streetwear is… dead. That's what Ablo himself called already in 2019. And it seems like, once again, he had the right feeling of where the world of fashion is heading.